Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about astrophysics and data analysis. It's a fairly big topic area, but it was maybe not quite big enough, so I'm going to throw in some stuff on stochastic processes in this first lecture. Um, there's a lot of material. I'm, I have slides on many different topics. Uh, I'll get through as much of it as possible. There are some things I might not get to. Uh, we'll make the slides available afterwards, um, so if you at your leisure you can read through them. If there's anything that we don't cover that you're interested in and you want to ask me about, then please send me an email. Um, equally, if there's anything in the lectures that you don't understand and want to talk to me about, find me afterwards uh, or send me an email. The email is on the first slide. Okay, so my rough plan of what I'll be covering um, today will be looking at principles of signal analysis. So all the other lecturers are focusing on sources and signals. Um, so today's lecture is the only one you'll get about noise. Uh, but understanding noise is very important for understanding uh, what we can and can't measure uh, with gravitational wave detectors. Um, so the first half of the lecture will cover some of those principles of signal analysis, and in particular, how to understand things that you'll read in papers uh, about gravitational wave sensitivity um, and sensitivity curves of detectors. In the second half of the lecture, I'll then uh, go through some estimates of detectability of sources. So uh, we'll calculate some strains uh, and scaling of these strains with things like frequency and mass. That'll be important that if you want to quickly assess whether something that you're interested in uh, might be observable or not. Okay, so that'll be today's lecture. Tomorrow's lecture in the morning, we'll be looking at the astrophysics part of the course, um, so sources of gravitational waves. Uh, I will review various sources of gravitational waves and some of the, uh, their properties and also some of the science we might be able to do uh, with them. Uh, and then the second lecture tomorrow will be all about data analysis. So I'll be talking about data analysis techniques. Uh, in the first half, um, how we search for signals in data, uh, and in the second half, how we then extract uh, information from them, so parameter estimation uh, or other characteristics of the sources. Okay, so first off, this lecture is about signal analysis. As I said, uh, this is going to be about noise, but the aim is ultimately for you to understand when you see a sensitivity curve of a gradational wave detector, what that really is showing you. Um, all gravitational wave sensitivity curves look the same. They look like this. <coughs> You have less sensitivity at one end of the band and less sensitivity at the other end of the band, and there is some optimum. Where this minimum is depends on the detector. Uh, Space-based detectors like LISA are sensitive uh, in millihertz. Uh, Ground-based detectors, this uh, peak sensitivity is around uh, 100 hertz. Okay? Uh, but you lose sensitivity at both ends of the band. Um, now, you'll think, you look at papers, they all look something like this but there are actually four different types of sensitivity curve you might see. Um, they all look a bit like this, but some actually look more like this, and some look more like that, and then some you know, look a bit like this. So there are multiple different possibilities. They are all useful for slightly different things, and there is no unique way to represent the sensitivity of a detector that can answer all questions you might want to answer with it. Uh, so what we'll hopefully do in this first lecture is explain uh, why you might uh, want to represent things in slightly different ways. And so then when you read a paper and you see one or other of these, uh, you'll understand what it uh, is useful for. OK, so the basic setup we're thinking about, we're measuring some data. That data is the output of a gravitational wave detector. So there's a signal in here, uh, hopefully. Um, that modeling that signal is uh, where we need GR, where we need all the techniques that you've heard about in the first uh, two sets of lectures, and you'll hear more about next week. Um, but what we also have in our gravitational wave detector is the noise. Um, there is fluctuations in, in the output of the detector, uh, which are essentially random, um, and they limit our ability to uh, extract information from that signal. Okay. So this noise is a random process, um, which means that you can't, you can never predict what future values of the noise will be, uh, even if you knew it perfectly at a given time, or you can make statements about it in the future, uh, are probabilistic things. You can say what is the distribution of possible states the noise might have uh, at later times. Okay, so um, you, you know, formally, mathematically, 
what the definition of a random process is that it's a, a series of uh, values that are drawn from um, an ensemble of probability distributions. And these probability distributions are the probability of that the noise in this case will have particular values uh, at particular times. Um, so in general, that probability distribution uh, could be anything you like, um, but we will make some assumptions that make uh, analysis a bit easier. Okay. Um, in particular, we're going to assume the time series is stationary, it's Gaussian, and it's ergodic. Okay. So what do these terms mean? Um, stationarity means that the absolute time is irrelevant. You know, you're talking about statistical properties um, of the instrument. Okay. So it doesn't matter when in the observing run of LIGO we're looking at the noise, um, it all, on average, it looks the same at any point in time. Okay? This doesn't mean that the noise at any time is uncorrelated to noise at other times. We expect the noise to wander a bit. It's not uh, a white process, so it's not that the noise at any given sample is completely independent of the previous one. Um, but it means that those, the probabilities depend only on the differences in times, not on the absolute <coughs> values of time. So the probability that the noise has particular values a certain set of times is exactly the same as the probability it has the same set of values um, at times that are shifted uniformly uh, by any arbitrary amount. Okay? So that's what we mean by stationarity. Um, Gaussianity is reasonably obvious. It's Gaussian if the probability distributions are Gaussian. Okay? So uh, that means that all of these probability distributions, uh, no matter how many uh, samples you're talking about, follow a, a joint Gaussian distribution. Um, this is a reasonable assumption thanks to the central limit theorem. We know that if you have large numbers of samples uh, of, from any probability distribution uh, and then start to average them, those averages uh, behave like Gaussian distributions once you have enough samples. Um, so this is a commonly used assumption um, and it's reasonably and it's valid because of the central limit theorem. It also makes life a lot easier in certain Senses because Gaussian distributions are characterized entirely by uh, their second moment. So their covariance uh, matrix determines all the properties of the distribution. Um, and so that makes life a bit easier. We only have to specify that second moment distribution uh, and then we know everything else. Okay. Uh, so the final assumption we will make is this one of ergodicity. Um, and this basically uh, is a statement that um, in a sequence drawn from your random process, so a given time series, uh, the noise eventually goes everywhere it could go. Okay. Um, so this means, so uh, then the notion of averaging over probability distributions is equivalent to averaging over time. So uh, when we, uh, what we care about for our gravitational wave detector is not all the possible noise series that it could have had, uh, but the noise series that it will have if we run it for arbitrarily long uh, in the future. And this ergodicity statement is saying that those are the same thing. If you average over long enough time, uh, it's the same as averaging over the uh, probability distribution of the noise. Okay, so um, what we want to do ultimately is find gravitational wave signals uh, in data. Um, to do this, we need to understand how large the noise is. Um, and so we want some ways to summarize the statistical properties. Uh, carrying around these complicated probability distributions is a little unwieldy. Um, so we want to think about ways in which we can summarize the properties of uh, the random process. Okay. Now we'll assume that the noise has zero mean. Uh, that's a reasonable assumption. Um, you can always any process that has a non-zero mean, you can subtract that mean from it and make it a zero mean process. Obviously, you then have to know what you need to subtract, um, but in practice, uh, yeah, that's, that's the problem of calibrating gravitational wave detectors, which is not completely solved, um, but it's solved well enough to make this a reasonable assumption. Um, and so, uh, having subtracted the mean, the main property of a random process we care about is its variance, so how much uh, the square of the um, process changes from time to time, um, and so you can, you're interested in 
average value of that quantity. Okay? Um, so this, the integral of n squared dt um, is essentially the power in your series, um, and it's clear that this is something that must grow with time. Okay? So you're adding together squares and quantities, the more we've said, because it's a stationary process, that the typical values of n are the same at any time, um, so the average square value of n will be something, uh, and as you integrate for long enough, this thing's going to increase like that average value of n squared times time. Uh, so this power, uh, integrated over all time, is uh, infinite, um, and so a better way to represent your stationary process is the average value of this quantity, um, so we replace this by 1 over t times the integral, uh, and then take the limit as t tends to infinity. Okay, so what this represents is that the average variance, uh, or the average power, in the noise fluctuations uh, in your detector. Now, thanks to um, Parsimal's theorem, we can transform to the frequency domain uh, and look at different Fourier components of the noise rather than uh, working entirely in the time domain. Um, there's a couple of subtleties here because we uh, really only have a finite amount of data, so we have an integral over a finite time and then take a limit, uh, but that doesn't change things too much. The point is that um, <coughs> the way you, do, you formally do this is you write the noise, time limited noise process as an infinite sequence times uh, a window function, um, and then you apply Parsifal's theorem to the, uh, to the function that's defined over infinite time, um, and so you can relate this power, which is an uh, integral of n squared dt. Parsifal's theorem tells us that that's the same as the integral of the Fourier transform squared df, um, and that then allows us to define something called a spectral density. Okay, so the spectral density is essentially uh, this quantity here divided by time, the um, Fourier transform or time series divided by uh, square root of t all squared. And so, uh, we have this formula vision. The power spectral density is the limit of t times infinity of 2 over t times the square of this uh, Fourier transform over the finite time interval. Okay? Um, so, one subtlety that comes in here is in terms of whether it's a one sided or two sided spectral density. Um, What's the difference? Well, one side, so we generally assume we're making real measurements. Okay, our gravitational wave detector has a real output, it's not a complex output. Any real time series, um, <coughs> essentially the information is encoded either in positive frequency components or in negative frequency components. And there's a conjugation relation between the two because the time series is real. Okay, now this means that um, your spectral density for your time series is the same for negative frequencies as for positive frequencies. Um, and so you can either talk about a two-sided spectral density, in which this Sn of f is defined for negative values of frequency um, as the same value as the positive frequencies, or you can talk in terms of a one-sided spectral density in which, which is defined to be zero for negative frequencies um, and twice this value for positive frequencies. So it's more common to see uh, one-sided spectral densities in <coughs> gravitational wave literature that both are used. The difference is just a factor of two. So the two-sided spectral density is half the value of the one-sided spectral density. Okay. Um, so what we've done is we've taken this power, this average power, um, and we've that defines a spectral density. So in some sense, that spectral density is the, power, the average power in the time series um, at a particular frequency. Okay? And the, this uh, total average power is the integral of the spectral density um, over positive frequencies, if it's the one-sided spectral density. Uh, now, another way you can interpret this is to think about um, mean square, well, to, to think about fluctuations. Okay? So, uh, we said the spectral density um, is, so sorry, this Pn is the integral over all time um, of the uh, Fourier transform squared, um, this, limit, so this is the 
Um, if you split that integral over all time into a number of uh, time segments of fixed width, and that's what we've done here, we've taken the integral uh, from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2, and split it up into uh, intervals of width delta t. Um, then this is you know, just the same expression I had before, but what you see is that you can now interpret what's going on here um, as it's a, an average over time segments of that fixed length, delta t, uh, of the Fourier transform. Okay? And so you can interpret this spectral density as being a measure of the size of fluctuations um, on time intervals, on fixed time intervals, which have corresponding fixed um, frequency with bandwidths, with delta f is 1 over delta t. Okay? And so another interpretation of the spectral density is that it's the size of mean square fluctuations at the particular frequency, um, and these are, so for a particular frequency that corresponds to a particular bandwidth, these RMS fluctuations are just the square root of the spectral density times that bandwidth. Okay. Um, so a couple more definitions and then we'll get into uh, sensitivity. Yeah. Um, so this spectral density, as we said, is a measure of the fluctuations of a particular frequency. But for a stationary process, what we also care about are correlations in time. Um, and so another useful thing you can uh, define for a time series is a quantum correlation. Um, definition looks similar, but now what you do is you take the average uh, products between the noise at a particular time and the noise at uh, time two or later than that, uh, and you average that over all time. And so this is saying, how similar the noise is a time two or later uh, than the uh, than any other particular time. Okay, so this is the autocorrelation because you're correlating the output of your you're correlating your series at one time with uh, a later time. Okay, you can also define cross correlations between two different time series, which look exactly the same. Uh, but now one of these becomes um, m rather than n, representing a different time series. Okay. Now this autocorrelation function is an average over time. If you have an ergodic space range, uh, sorry, if you have an ergodic random process, and all ergodic random processes are necessarily stationary, um, we've said that the definition of this is that time averages become um, ensemble averages, so averages over probability distributions, uh, and so this autocorrelation function, as well as being an average over time, is an average over realizations of your random process. Now, this autocorrelation function is not a different thing to the spectral density. It represents something different, but they are closely related by something called the Wiener Pinching Theorem. Um, and that tells us the autocorrelation function is the Fourier transform of the spectral density. Okay? And you, it's easy to prove. It's just an application of the convolution theorem for Fourier transforms. We know that if you take uh, the convolution of two series, so you integrate um, N of T and N of T minus tau, for example, uh, the Fourier transform of that involved series is just the product of the Fourier transforms. Okay? And so um, this is a convolution. Its Fourier transform is therefore the product of the Fourier transform of n with the Fourier transform of n. That's the Fourier transform of n squared, which is exactly what the uh, spectral density is. So another consequence um, of this theorem is that for stationary processes, uh, you can derive this result that the expectation value of the Fourier transform of your noise at two different frequencies um, is uh, equal to the spectral density times a delta function, delta of f minus f dashed. Again, this is just a simple application of results from uh, Fourier series. We know that the autocorrelation function is the Fourier transform of uh, the spectral Sorry, well, uh, it's the Fourier transform of spectral density. We know that um, you, uh, the, for a product time series, this iteration function is the expectation value of n of t times n of t plus tau. You can replace n of t by its inverse Fourier transform and simply n of t plus tau. You then apply this expectation value and that gives you an expectation value of this quantity n to the root of n times n to the root of n dash. 
uh, and this result falls out. Okay. So what does it mean? Well, what this is telling you is that for a stationary random process, fluctuations at different frequencies are independent of one another. And this, the variance in those fluctuations is given by this spectral density. So that's again another interpretation of the spectral density. It is the variance in fluctuations at a particular frequency. So if you want to generate um, a random time series, it's actually easier often to work in the Fourier domain, because if it is stationary, you can just generate a bunch of samples at different frequencies um, with um, ver um, variances given by SN of F. Uh, and because they have this delta function, they're independent of one another, um, and that then gives you uh, a representation of the time series which uh, corresponds to the particular autocorrelation function or spectral density uh, that you'd originally specified. Okay, so um, a few examples that uh, you might across. Um, spectral density of a white noise process is constant. A white noise process is one for which um, essentially every, the noise in every sample is independent of the noise in every other sample and that's the same variance. So your uh, autocorrelation function is uh, a delta function and for a transformer delta function is a constant. Um, and so the white noise spectrum corresponds to it. Spectral density, uh, and then you have various types of spectral density that have um, negative, depending on power or dependence on frequency, negative exponents. Uh, if you have an f to the minus one type spectral density, it corresponds to quick and more, you see this in um, essentially uh, light. Um, and uh, if you have a random walk process, so uh, at any time the um, noise jumps with equal probability in either direction by a fixed amount, uh, then you can ensure that the spectral density actually has an f to the minus 2 uh, type behavior. Okay, um, so the last comment on spectral densities is this thing I mentioned before. Uh, I'd be talking about a single time series because that's what will be most relevant uh, in most of what we, you come across connected to gravitational wave detectors, but we do have more than one detector. And for certain types of search, which I'll talk about a bit of tomorrow, um, you want to cross-correlate the output of two different detectors rather than just looking at the output of one. Um, if you're doing that, then you're more interested in uh, cross-spectral densities um, and cross-correlations are defined in exactly the same way, it's just to replace one of your ends uh, by the other time series. Um, and you know, as before, the cross spectral density and the cross correlation are Fourier transforms of one another. Okay, so um, as I said early on, the advantage of assuming that the process is Gaussian is that this uh, spectral density, which is the two-point function, so it's telling you about correlations uh, between two different uh, times or two different frequencies, uh, that conveys all the information you need to generate realizations of the process. Okay, so a Gaussian station random process is completely summarized by its mean, which we're assuming zero, um, and the spectral density. And so it's perfectly natural that if we have a gravitational wave detector, um, and it's not unreasonable to assume that it's Gaussian and stationary, and there are gravitational wave detectors are not Gaussian, they're not stationary, but they are approximately Gaussian and stationary. Um, so this gives us a nice way to summarize the detector sensitivity. Okay? But it doesn't really tell us much about how well that detector will be able to see a particular type of source, um, because we only know about the spectral density properties of uh, the noise. We haven't said anything so far about sources. So um, how do we represent sources on the same diagram as a spectral density? Uh, and unfortunately, there isn't a unique way to do this. Uh, different source types are best represented in different ways. What we really want from a uh, plot of a 
of a gravitational wave sensitivity curve is some quick way to be able to say, well, um, I'm, I have a source with these properties, will it be detected or not? Okay, so you want some way to take your sensitivity curve, put your source on the same, same plot, and say, well, that's above the line, so we can detect it, or it's below the line, so we can't. Now, there isn't a unique way to do this, and that's because different types of source um, will have to be detected in different ways, and so they're best, re best represented in different ways. Um, so I'm going to now say a little bit about um, four different types of source. I'm going to first talk about burst sources. I'm then going to talk about um, in-spiraling. So, so I'm going to talk about burst sources, and I'm going to talk about continuous wave sources, so they're things that are essentially monochromatic in frequency. I'll then talk about in-spirals, and I'll finish off uh, with backgrounds. Okay, so um, if you have a burst of gravitational waves, typically we don't know very much about it. What we might know about a burst is that it has a particular typical frequency. We all know how long the burst lasts, maybe, and we'll know something about its bandwidth, so the range of frequencies um, in which the burst has non-negligible power. Okay, but we don't know enough about the signal to do um, the, the filtering that we'll be talking about later for in-spiral sources. Um, but, and so it's very much like a spectral, so a random process in that sense. What we can do, characterize a burst with, is its power. So we use this notion of power for uh, noise so far. We take the um, average of the integral of n squared over all time. If we have a burst, we can write down something very similar. We can take the average of the, the signal power. Okay? And this is. 1 over t times the integral of h squared over t. It has the same units as h, which is dimensionless. Um, and so this is uh, a characteristic amplitude we can use to represent the burst. Okay. Now, it's important when you're defining this that you don't, um, so we're not doing exactly the same thing as we did in the noise case. The noise case, we're taking a limit as t tends to infinity of an integral like this. That's because your noise process continues forever. We're doing this ergodicity uh, averaging. Um, for a burst, it will have a finite duration. If you average over all time, this number tends to zero. Okay? Um, but if you average over the duration of the burst, then you can come up with a quantity, which is representative of the power in the signal while, it's, uh, while, while it lasts. Okay? So what do we want to compare it with? Well, we want to compare it with the power in the noise. And we said that the power of the noise is basically given by f times sh, where, uh, sorry, S -S um, where uh, that f is the sort of typical width um, in frequency space of the um, And so if you are interested in the noise over the bandwidth of the signal, so the range of frequencies at which the signal is uh, first is emitting, then you can take delta f times sn, and that is a measure of the power in the noise uh, in that same bandwidth. Okay. And so now, if we want to know if we can detect a burst or not, we want to compare the power in the signal to the power in the noise. And that gives us something called a signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, now, a signal-to-noise ratio is defined for um, amplitudes of power, power is the square amplitude, so the ratio of powers gives us the square of the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and so, in this particular example, you take um, the power of the signal, which we can find to be the squared, and divide it by the bandwidth, delta f times sh, um, and that gives us an estimate of uh, signal to noise ratio. Okay. Now, if you wanted to realize this in practice, um, what you need to do is carefully window and band pass your data. So, we've said the burst is only contributing for a certain range of time and a certain range of frequencies. We basically need to, to only look at that range of times and frequencies in our detector, um, and then we know that the signal is contributing this much more power in that uh, block of time and frequency than the noise is. Okay. So, windowing means you take a certain range of times, band passing means you take, take a certain range of frequencies. Okay. And so, this thing leads to this, um, this result, and we find that for burst sources, um, Signal noise ratio squared, which is a measure of detectability, um, is typically characterized by this characteristic amplitude, which is its average h squared over its duration, divided by delta f times sh, the rate distribution sn, 
sorry, I thought they changed all of these. You'll see um, people use SH for the uh, or SN. Uh, you should really say SH for when you're talking about power and a signal, whereas I've been using uh, the S's in this lecture will be to do the more this is a little short of pain in some sort um, anyway, so if you assume that this delta f, this bandwidth, is approximately the same as the frequency, that's fairly typical for things that produce bursts, the range of frequencies is comparable to the frequency itself, um, then you can replace this delta f by an f, and you get this notion of signal noise ratio for a burst source, that is its square amplitude divided by f times sh. Okay. Um, so this motivates representing your uh, sensitivity by plotting f times s rather than just s itself. Okay. Now, if you see f times s, it will normally be called characteristic strain. Um, well, the square root of that will be characteristic strain. Um, it itself will be, I don't know, characteristic power, maybe, characteristic strain power. Um, but that is different to the power spectral density. So, s n on its own is the power spectral density, f times s n. Uh, square rooted is what's called the characteristic strain. Um, if you do produce a plot of f times sh and you uh, insert the power spectral density, then if you have a particular burst source for which you know hc squared, you can plot that on the same uh, plot. If it lies above the line, then you have signal noise ratio greater than one, which means it's plausibly detectable. So basically, you're saying that there is more power in the signal. And the noise, and so there's a chance you'll be able to dig it out of the data. Okay, so that's burst sources, but um, we haven't observed any burst sources with LIGO yet. Uh, there is hope that one day we'll see a supernova that's near enough to give significant gravitational wave emission, but that's uh, not happened yet. But there are other types of source of gravitational waves, um, some of which we have seen and we need to understand how we can represent those as well. Okay, so if you now think about a monochromatic source, uh, so something that is constant in frequency, um, so h is h naught times a cos or a sine of 2 pi uh, ft, um, then the signal power for this kind of source is constant over time as well, um, because the frequency doesn't evolve, um, and it's basically equal to, uh, if you take this, Average 1 over t, I missed out 1 over t here, you take 1 over t times the integral h squared, you're basically integrating h naught squared times cos squared. Um, integral of cos squared uh, is essentially a half times time, um, and so you end up with this signal power, which is a half times h naught squared. Okay. So this is constant, it's constant for these continuous wave sources, but the, all of that power is in a very narrow frequency band, because it's all coming out of the frequency of f naught. Now we can't resolve frequencies with infinite resolution. Um, typically, what you can do if you have a observed for a time of t, then you can resolve frequencies um, up to uh, a uncertainty of 1 over that observation time. Okay, so this tends to 0 as t tends to 30, but over a certain observation time, we can expect to resolve frequencies down to 1 over t. Okay. Now, for this monochromatic source, all of this power, this h naught squared over 2, will be concentrated in uh, the frequency band of width 1 over t centered at f naught. Now, the noise power in that band will be Sn times delta f, and so that's Sn divided by t. Okay. And so, for monochromatic sources, it's not Remember, for the burst source, what we had was f times sn. Um, for the continuous wave sources, we had sn divided by t, where t is the length of observation. So this is now a, a problem, in a sense. Um, it means we have to plot something different for continuous wave sources than we do for burst sources. The other thing that's a bit of an issue is that we need to say how long one detector is going to take the data. And that's fine for uh, if you're summarizing a science run that's finished, so LIGO did uh, the O1 science run, it's now done the O2 science run, that's a finite data set, you can analyze that, you know how long you observe for, so you can work out these things on. 
But if you're interested in saying, well, if LIGO is continuously uh, taking data in the future, um, this T will constantly be changing, and so you have to constantly update uh, what you're reporting. Uh, so that is uh, an issue, but you'll typically specify it for something convenient, like a year, um, and then you can scale it easily enough. Okay. Um, so, just to finish this off, um, you will see sensitivity curves, which will again be called characteristic strain, um, although it's a different characteristic strain to the characteristic strain density uh, for burst sources. They are plotting square root of SN over T, or sometimes uh, a small number times the square root of SN over T. Now this small number represents uh, typically five or eight. That is the threshold you think you need in simple noise ratio to be confident that it's a real source. Um, and so uh, the reason for plotting, say, eight times root SN over T, um, is if you then say, oh, I've got this uh, pulsar, which I think should have an intrinsic coronation wave amplitude of 10 to the minus 25, you can compare that to this, and if it lies above that line, you know that you will get an SNR bigger than 8 um, by observing that particular source uh, in that data set. Okay, so the advantage of these curves is that you can tell straight away if a particular monochromatic source is detectable or not, um, with that specified threshold, but there's this disadvantage that you need to say how long you've been observing for, and so it's hard to produce these things for detectors that um, are yet to be uh, operated. Um, now you will see these things in publications. This is an example from uh, Lisa Fahey's pre-phase A report, which was published in the late 90s. Um, you'll notice that this curve here is marked Lisa threshold, one year estimation, single noise ratio of okay, So this tells you everything. Uh, you, this row fresh in that definition is five, and t is equal to one year. So what they've done is taken the PSC for Lisa, they divided by one year, taken the square root, and multiplied by uh, five. And that gives us this curve here. Interestingly, this pre-phase eight rule was written 20 years ago, and Lisa entered phase A this year. Um, <laughs> it, is, it was very pre-phase A. I wasn't expecting to take that long, but at least we've got there now. Uh, you'll also see similar things in uh, LIGO papers. I think this is constructed in a slightly different way, uh, but the principle is the same. You have as a function of frequency, um, you have a strain on the vertical axis, and this represents things that would have been detectable. So you have a source, which frequency 400 hertz, and a strain of 10 to the minus 24, you would find it was here, and so it lies above these various lines, and it would have been detected by LIGO in that particular uh, observing run. So if, it, if it's a source that you believe is real, and it wasn't detected, then uh, your assumptions must be wrong. Um, so one final comment is, you'll also see things called sky average sensitivity curves. Um, what, so that's just folding into the fact, the fact that uh, the orientation of a source to your line of sight can make a difference. It's more, it's primarily for inspiral sources rather than um, continuous wave sources, but because you can get different amounts of emission in different directions, uh, you can average over orientations of the source and sky locations. Um, so LISA, for example, is more sensitive to sources in particular directions than others, and so is LIGO at a given time. Uh, and so you'll see sky average sensitivity curves, which basically have uh, noise that's enhanced um, because uh, of this averaging process. And typically, you have a factor of five increase in your noise from this averaging for LIGO, and a 20 over three increase for LISA. The difference here is a factor of four thirds, and that's because LISA has 63 arms, um, and that's just the sine of 60 squared. Okay, so we talked about their sources, we talked about continuous wave sources. They were both easy in the sense that you could rate, relate them directly to uh, the same concepts for the, as, that we use for the PSD, namely the average power uh, in the signal or in the noise uh, over, over all time. 
For inspiring sources, you can't do that um, because the total energy emitted at each frequency is finite. The source inspirals and then stops. It reaches merger and stops emitting gravitational waves. And so if you actually looked at the, this uh, sort of spectral density equivalent, which would be h to the uh, square root of t, that tends to zero um, as t tends to infinity. Okay, so the spectral density of an inspiral source is zero if you extract that all the time. And we can play the same game that we played, uh, that we argued for the burst source, which is that you can band pass, so you're only considering the range of relevant frequencies, and you can win those, you're only considering the range, relevant range of times, and that gets you some of this power back. But you can ask yourself for something like an inspiraling source where you can predict uh, fairly precisely the frequency it should have in it as a function of time, can we do any better than this? Uh, and the answer is yes. And the way you can do better is not by using your raw time series, but by doing some filtering. Okay, so windowing and band passing, that's a type of filter. Um, but if you're looking for a particular source, you can do much better by doing something called match filtering, uh, which we'll talk about now. Okay. So a filtered time series is basically um, the product of your time series times my filter. That's convolution. You have some kernel. Um, it could be a Gaussian window, for example. It could be something else. But you take your original time series, you uh, multiply it by the kernel, and integrate them all time, and then you shift where the center of that kernel is, um, and so you're effectively averaging the signal over, over the width of your kernel, um, but centered at different times. And that then gives you a slightly different uh, time series. Um, this slightly different time series, you can do all the same things that we've just been talking about. In particular, you can work out spectral densities and powers uh, in this filtered time series. Um, so, in particular, what we can look at is something that is very similar to the signal to noise ratio we were using before. The signal to noise ratio we defined as the um, power in the signal to the power in the noise. You can also just compare the amplitude in the signal to the square root of the power in the noise. It's two uh, equivalent. Um, and so you can now, uh, with this definition of your uh, filter time series, you can define the signal noise ratio, which is a function of time, because uh, you've got this t here, uh, which is the filter output at that time divided by the square root of the power in the filtered noise uh, over all, all time. Okay. Um, and so what we can then ask is how do we choose k for a given h to make this as big as possible? Um, and so that's what we'll do, and we'll find that we want to take k to be proportional to h over the spectral density. Okay. Now if we do this, then the, uh, so with this definition of the loss ratio, then the, um, if we take our series s, which is a combination of h and n, uh, then what we get out of it is um, s plus, basically s plus n with the new definitions. Uh, so the um, fluctuations in that noise term uh, are, um, are of amplitude, uh, so with n divided by s. <coughs> I don't think I said that very clearly. The point is that uh, this is essentially Doing this filtering, you'll get a, a signal component coming out of it and a noise component coming out of it. And our signal to noise is basically a ratio of the size of that signal component to the variance, or to the standard deviation of the noise component, which is the size of the uh, amount that the filter output fluctuates uh, about this um, pure signal value. Uh, okay, so this S is the time series. So on the very first slide, I wrote S is uh, H plus N. Okay, so what we can construct once we've got our data is, so we don't know what H is, so we measured S, so we can construct this W as the filtered version of S. And now we're saying that let's suppose we, let's suppose we didn't know what H and N were, um, then the contribution within S from the signal is this ratio larger than the contribution from the noise. And so if we make this bigger, 
more of the filtered output is coming from signal and from noise, and so we're more likely to be able to uh, tell that there's a signal there. Okay, so what you can then ask is what um, choice of filter maximizes the signal noise ratio. This definition is a function of time, um, so we can choose a particular time at which we want to maximize the signal noise ratio, and we do that at zero lag, so t equals zero, um, which makes time a bit easier. Um, so the, this definition of the filter is a convolution of a kernel with a time series, um, and as we've said already, from properties of Fourier series, the Fourier transform of a convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. And so you have W2 where is the A2 where is H2 where. Okay. So this definition of signal to noise ratio is um, is this basically W over um, the average of uh, W, sorry. Uh, this is yeah, so. This is W of T. Um, yeah, what am I saying? Uh, right. So this quantity at the top here is W of T, and we've said that W of T is the Fourier transform of W of T, W to the of F, is um, basically uh, K to the times h tilde, and hence w of t is the inverse Fourier transform of k tilde times h tilde. Okay, so that will be the integral of k tilde times h tilde times an e to the minus 2 pi i, so e to the plus 2 pi i ft factor. If we then evaluate it at t equals 0, uh, that factor goes away. Okay, so that's all we end up with this expression that doesn't have um, a the Fourier transform piece in it, it's because we're interested in working at zero lag uh, rather than the arbitrary time. Okay. Um, the piece in the bottom simplifies because we can write, uh, so again, we have integrals over time, we replace these as frequency integrals, um, and there are two of them because we've got a square here, and then we can use this property of spectral densities that the expectation value of n tilde at one frequency, and then until they're at another frequency, is proportional to a delta function. That's very badly written, something like that. Um, and so that then simplifies what's in the denominator, and it boils down to just being the integral of k squared times the spectral density. Okay, so you have two frequency integrals, but you, you get a delta function from taking the expectation value. Uh, and then you do one of those integrals uh, and you end up with this expression. Okay, so um, this looks. So, what do we do now? Well, we can simplify things a bit further by defining an inner product um, as basically being uh, the <coughs> product of the Fourier transforms. Um, you divide it slightly differently to make sure it's real. You take h1 until the time of h2. So the star plus h1 star into two times. Um, but if you define in a product in this way as twice this integral weighted by uh, sh, then what we have in this definition of signal to noise ratio is essentially the inner product of k times sh with h, um, and then uh, k times sh all squared, uh, with, sorry, uh, which is the overlap of k sh with itself. And so our signal to noise ratio can be written in this form. The, uh, this inner product of h with shk divided by the square root of the inner product of shk with itself. Okay. Now, why do we do this? Well, this is just the dot product of a vector with a unit vector. Okay. When you divide by the square root of the magnitude of this, you're making it a unit vector. And we're now asking which particular choice of unit vector maximizes this dot product. And we know that that is the one that's parallel to the thing that we want to retain the dot product with. Okay. And so the thing that maximizes the signal noise ratio is taking SHK to be uh, parallel to H. Okay. Or in other words, K is proportional to H over SH. Um, now, this is called the, the Wiener optimal filter, same guy. Um, 
Nina, who uh, did the Nina Tinchin theorem. Uh, I noticed I've spelled his name differently here than on the previous slide. One of them is correct. I think it's the other one, so don't worry. I'll correct it before I give the slides to Barry. Um, but the point is that the, what we found is that the way you maximize signal noise ratio by filtering is to choose a filter that is proportional to your signal, but weighted by noise in the detector. So essentially, you, this says you don't care as much about components of your signal where the noise in your detector is big, you care more about the ones where the noise is low. So it's intuitive, makes sense. Um, now, if you use an optimal filter, then the signal noise ratio you get, because of this inner product analogy, is just um, the square root of the uh, inner product of H with itself. Now, um, yeah, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail on the next slide. Uh, but the more important thing to note is that for monochromatic sources, uh, the match filter is the, the Fourier transform. Okay, so we, when we motivated uh, sensitivities to continuous wave sources, we just looked at uh, doing the Fourier transform effectively. We just looked at um, the power at a particular frequency. Uh, this says that that's actually the optimal way to filter for those signals anyway. Okay, so we haven't treated continuous wave sources in a less rigorous way than we've treated the inspiral sources. Yeah. I think I have a misconception about what you introduced before as the time dependent signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. I think in my mind I see that as the signal, uh, signal to noise that accumulates as the, as the signal passes through and then eventually the signal is you know, gone and you have the, the largest S, you okay. know, S to N, which is the, the, you know, the yeah. initial one, but that's not it. Right, uh, right. so um, what I have defined here is the time dependent signal to noise ratio. You filter them all time. Um, it's just where the center of the filter has been replaced. So the T here is where you're putting the center of your kernel. Um, and so it's like, uh, so we've said our optimal filter is the same as the waveform. Um, so if we change T away from zero, we're offsetting the two waveforms. And so we start to lose uh, SNR, so it's not as optimal. Um, you're right that in, yeah, we've now found that if we have the whole signal, what we want to do is uh, take this filter, which is equal to H. Um, as we're collecting data, we can start doing that, and we'll see the SNR increasing gradually as the object in spirals, and then eventually it merges and we can reach a maximum. So from a data analysis point of view, we do have another time dependent signal noise ratio, which is exactly that, but for the purposes of proving this, it was a slightly different definition that assumes we have all the data anyway, and we're just offsetting it. Okay, so um, for this match filter, the signal noise ratio is basically the inner product of the waveform with itself uh, to, the, to the half. So the signal noise ratio squared is that inner product, and the definition of the inner product was this uh, h squared divided by the noise in the detector. Okay, so you'll see this expression uh, all over the place. Um, this always gives you the signal noise ratio squared, but for match filtering. So you have done some analysis uh, in order to realize this. Okay, so that's important to remember. Um, there are a number of different ways you can write it to make it look a bit more like things we've uh, had before. Um, a common thing to do is to replace this df by d log f. Uh, the reason for doing that is that typically gravitational wave detectors have uh, sensitivity over a few orders of magnitude in frequency, uh, so you'll typically represent your sensitivity curve with a logarithmic scale horizontally. Okay, so putting log f here, you need to add a factor of f somewhere else, um, and so then plotting the argument for this is that you can then integrate by log. If you plotted s, m, and f um, on a logarithmic scale, and you also plot f times h squared, then you can add up basically the area between your in spiral and the signal um, and your noise curve, and that's uh, an estimate of how much SNR is accumulated uh, as a function of frequency. So this is called integration by I, um, but it's another convention we'll see 
Um, if you want to make this thing that is non atypical what we define to be characteristic strain force, that was F times S, then we need to multiply the thing that is non atypical in the numerator by the factor of So um, F squared, H silver squared uh, is what you need to plot if you have represented your sensitivity using F times SH rather than uh, SH. This integration of the is a trick to be able to do the final. Right. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, what people like to be able to do, you've plotted your sensitivity curve, which uh, for sake of argument, let's say, was f times s of f. Um, if you, you've got log of frequency on the horizontal axis, and you then plot f squared h tilde squared um, for your in spiraling signal, this area is approximately your signal noise ratio as well. So things that have more area above your noise curve have higher SNR. So that's what you mean by integrating by I. Um, I think you'll also see S plotted commonly, and then you really need F times H to the square, so you have to be a bit careful uh, in doing this. Um, but if you ever have to calculate something, then it's best to just go to this formula, um, because you'll definitely get the right answer then. Okay. Uh, okay, good. On track. There's a couple more things to talk about. So, um, we're now going to relate this thing, which is our match logic SNR, to uh, the characteristic strain that we defined for burst sources before. Um, for burst sources, we said we had. SNR squared we accumulated was HC squared over FSH. So we're basically going to call this thing at the top, F squared H to the squared, we're going to say that that is the characteristic strain of an inspired source. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, there's another way you can write it down, and that's basically by uh, thinking about what H, uh, the Fourier transform is at a particular frequency. Um, and essentially, this scales by the amplitude of that frequency divided by the square root of F dot. And that's just the stationary phase approximation. If you integrate uh, cos of f dot t squared over time, you get a uh, over f dot. Um, but it's essentially how you can estimate the scaling of uh, your Fourier transform of your signal. Okay. Um, so h tilde goes like h naught over root f dot. So h tilde squared goes like h naught squared over f dot. And f squared times this goes like f squared times h naught squared over f dot. Uh, and that's what we call characteristic strain squared. Uh, informal definition in thin and form um, in has a factor of 2 in there. Um, but if you're, whether you include it or not, it's not super important. The important thing is the factors of f and f dot. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, the reason that this characteristic strain um, is Relevant is that it um, is the same thing we had for the burst sources. Uh, burst sources, we said SNR squared was HC squared divided by F times SH. For an in spiraling source where you are doing match filtering, your SNR squared is um, F squared H tilde squared over FSH. Uh, <coughs> in a bandwidth equal to frequency, so delta log F. Um, and that motivates this definition of characteristic strain. So it's a measure of the signal noise ratio you accumulate while the frequency sweeps through a bandwidth equal to frequency. So bandwidth equal to frequency, delta f equals f, that means delta log f is equal to 1. Okay. So this thing here is 1, and so this is the contribution to s r squared. Okay, so um, you'll see characteristic strain talked about in papers and plots of um, if you're plotting characteristic strain, you want to be plotting, plotting the strain spectral density, which is the square root of f times uh, Sn, um, and your signal noise ratio is basically your C squared of uh, Hn squared um, for uh, integrated over log frequency. Okay, now one final uh, comment on characteristic strain. 
you'll notice in this definition, f squared over f dot is essentially the number of cycles the n-spiral spends in the vicinity of frequency f. Okay? So if we're saying how long does it take for the frequency to change by uh, an amount equal to f, then that time is f divided by f dot. And so the number of cycles you produce during that time is just f times time, which is f squared over f dot. Okay. So this quantity in brackets is effectively the square root of the number of cycles spent in the vicinity of a particular frequency. So you'll hear people talking about signal to noise ratio being enhanced by square root of the number of cycles. <coughs> this is what they mean. If you're doing match filtering, you basically gain by the square root of the number of cycles because you're using your filter to phase match um, your signal at that particular frequency and Builds up uh, your signal to noise ratio. Okay, so, uh, this is something again that you will read in papers and it's important to understand where it comes from. Uh, and it comes from this uh, derivation that I've just gone through. Okay, so a good paper that, to, well, a classic paper that talks about characteristic strains, this one I think before, 2000. Um, it was a paper about LISA and tube mass ratio wind spirals. Uh, and all of their results are represented on the characteristic strain plots, where they're plotting the square root of n times sh to represent the noise, uh, and they're using this definition of the characteristic strain uh, to represent the signals. So, this is an example. And we've got a bunch of different wind spirals here, corresponding to different choices of mass and mass ratio, and you have points noted uh, according to how long the source has until it plunges in each case. Okay, so the final thing to talk about is uh, stochastic backgrounds. So there are sources of gradational waves which um, produce essentially random noise. Okay. So you have populations of sources that are so new, you have so many sources individually contributing that uh, you can't resolve them individually. What you get is just uh, some you know, power in gravitational waves uh, in your detector. Um, and similarly, there may be backgrounds of this kind generated in the other universe. Okay. Now, that is a random process in the same way that the noise in the detector is a random process. So it's natural to characterize backgrounds by power spectral densities as well. Um, and then you can just plot it on the same axis as the detector PSD. Uh, there are two caveats. One is that power is not power. Uh, what we've been talking about so far it has been um, average strain squared. Um, and so one thing we want to do is actually make it something that's physically meaningful as a, an energy density. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the other caveat is that if you just draw two spectral densities uh, on a plot, it doesn't tell you anything about whether you can <coughs> distinguish one from another. Okay? The way we detect backgrounds is by having more than one detector, um, and so uh, it, you can't really represent um, that with two spectral densities. Okay? Now, there is a technique that's been discussed in the literature, which I will describe, uh, for representing backgrounds in a way that conveys detectability, um, but we'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, so to deal with this first caveat, um, we've been talking about uh, energy, um, sorry, we've been talking about power spectral densities, but this has been all to do with the average value of h squared, h is a dimensionless quantity, uh, and energy density, well, has dimensions of 1 over mass squared, um, because we're relativists. So energy has units of mass, uh, with c equals one, and an energy density is an energy per unit volume. Volume has units of length cubed, which is mass cubed, and so energy density is going to like one over mass squared. Um, and so the way you get an estimate energy density in a gravitational wave is by taking a time derivative and squaring it. So the energy density in a gravitational wave is proportional to h dot squared. 
Um, and so, yeah, rather than ca calculating spectral densities for our time series, we can take spectral densities of the derivative of our time series. Um, that's fine if you are doing this Fourier uh, decomposition of it, that a time derivative corresponds to multiplication by frequency. And so, the easy way to get uh, physical energy density um, representation is to multiply everything by x squared. So the spectral density for um, fluctuations uh, in h dot is uh, f squared times sh, uh, and the analog of this uh, quantity that represents fluctuations in a particular bandwidth equal to frequency um, becomes f u sh. So, uh, we typically express energy densities for physical backgrounds um, as fractions of the closure density of the universe. Okay, so, um, those of you who've done cosmology courses, this is the uh, matter density the universe would have to have if it was to have uh, to be flat, basically, to be critical density in which those changes from being open to closed. Uh, and it's equal to um, 3h naught squared over f times g, and so typically we express energy densities in gravitational wave backgrounds um, as uh, an omega, which is this uh, energy in a bandwidth equal to energy density in a bandwidth equal to frequency, uh, divided by this energy density needed to close the universe. Okay, as um, we said, this. Um, you know, the difference between the energy density and the strain uh, power is a factor of f squared, and so you can also relate this omega to a characteristic squared strain by uh, in this this way. So omega is f squared h c squared. So if you see ta papers talking about backgrounds, they may quote things in terms of omegas, they may quote things in terms of h c squared, but for a background, the definition of h c is omega divided by f squared. And omega is really the physical thing that you can actually calculate. You can calculate the energy density um, that is contained in the background as a function of log frequency. Okay, so regarding the second caveat, um, as I said, you know, it's reasonable to plot uh, S of F for your background, and uh, sorry, it's reasonable to plot, say, um, F squared SN for your detector and omega for your background. Um, and if one is above the other, then maybe you can detect it, maybe you can't. Uh, but in practice, we don't typically know exactly what the energy density in our detectors, so the spectral density of our detectors is, so we need to use cross correlations and figure out backgrounds. And so there was a proposal by, in a paper by Thrain and Romano in 2013 that what you could, uh, one way you can represent sensitivity to backgrounds is using something called a power law sensitivity curve. So essentially, the idea here is um, you make some assumption about your data analysis. Um, now that's, you know, this then puts it in the category of those continuous wave sensitivity curves where we specified the length of an observation. Um, in this case, we say, oh, I'm going to take this detector with this amount of observation and this detector with this amount of observation. I'm going to do a cross correlation in this particular way. Um, and then I'm going to threshold in this other particular way. Okay, so you have a Define data analysis procedure. Um, and then what you can do is say, let's suppose that my energy density omega had a power law form. So it was A, F to some power alpha. Given that data analysis procedure, I can work out my um, how detectable it is and what. And I can work out for that particular value of alpha what A is the smallest I could detect. And so that process defines for every alpha um, a minimal amplitude that is detectable. And so you then vary alpha. You take you know, for alphas that are very steep and negative, maybe you get this value for an alpha that's slightly less uh, negative, maybe you get this value, and so on. And then you do this procedure for a range of all possible values of alpha, and you get an envelope. Okay, and that's what is shown in this plot here. Each of these lines is the uh, limiting amplitude at a particular slope uh, for which the background can be detected. Okay. Having done this, you get a nice smooth curve 
And if somebody comes along and says, well, I've got a prediction that this particular process will generate a background with slope of minus five thirds and amplitude of minus seven, you come along and you can draw that on this diagram. If what you draw passes through the region above this curve, then it lies above the corresponding limit from that line, and hence it is detectable. Okay? And so this power law sensitivity curve is purely something that said allows uh, users who are not from the uh, instrumentation community to say if what they're interested in is detectable. Now, in the other cases of the other sources, in spirals and continuous waves and so on, um, you could have a single curve that has some meaning in terms of the detector and some meaning in terms of detectability. In background, that's not the case because there is a, an embedded assumption about how you're doing the analysis here. And so, if we come along with another detector or we observe for longer, uh, these curves are constantly changing. Uh, but again, what you can do is in any particular paper, you can, um, at the end of a science run, you summarize your results, you produce one of these curves, and people can go away. Uh, and test their predictions and ask whether they would have been seen um, or not. Okay. Yep. To comment on, so when I see this done for stochastic backgrounds, I'm sort of uh, struck by the fact that it seems very far removed from what is actually being done. Uh, in the sense that when you consider, you know, sensitivity and things like that for bursts or continuous waves, you're, you, know, you know that you're measuring the strain and you try to compare that measurement of the strain in some convenient way to a noise measurement and you try to package this in the best possible way. But when you do it for stochastic backgrounds, well, yeah, now you start talking about energy, but you don't measure energy. And more than that, you normalize energy to closure uh, density and that's completely irrelevant for measurements that you do with the gravitational detector. So there seems to be all this baggage that comes from the yeah. standard cosmology that is really not pertinent to, to what we're doing. Uh, you yes, know, when we do I think works. those are all fair points. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm not going to argue that the way this is done is necessarily better or uh, works. I think there is a you know, there is this fundamental problem with detecting stochastic backgrounds that the analysis is. Um, much more complicated than simple match filtering. I'll say a bit about it tomorrow. Um, and therefore, there isn't an easy way to talk about detectability. Now, in terms of um, whether it's sensible to work in terms of omegas or not, then I think I completely agree with you that uh, what effectively happens in when people derive the <coughs> stochastic background for a particular source type. They put in this factor of you know, 8 pi g over 3 h naught squared uh, at the end, and then we come and do analysis, and the first thing we do is take it out. And, um, so you know, there's essentially no point. But it, uh, it does at least allow you to compare you know, natural, in some sense, predictions from cosmological models to the levels of astrophysical foregrounds. Um, and so I think there are some reasons for it, but I also agree that since for most of our operating gravitational wave detectors, the expectation is that any background we see is going to be astrophysical and not cosmological, then really we should be taking that factor of closer density out of the cosmological predictions rather than putting it into the astrophysical readings. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll have a coffee break now, uh, but just to summarize what was in this first half of today's lecture. Um, when reading papers, you've got to be a bit careful that what people are plotting is what you think they're plotting, because there are four different things you might come across, and they have different uses. Uh, you may see power spectral density. Um, that's the thing you actually calculate when you're just trying to understand the noise properties of a particular detector. Um, you may see strain spectral densities, of which there are two different types. Um, there's this one in which you're just dividing the spectral density by the time of observation, which is relevant sources, uh, but there's the other one which you're multiplying by f, and that's relevant for the sources and also uh, in spirals. Uh, and then you may also see this energy spectral density, which is uh, this extra factor of uh, f squared. Um, and that is most relevant for the background, as I was just saying, you don't really need to put this factor 
square in is just um, purely to make it any more to make units than that of an energy density. Uh, but it doesn't actually change anything about uh, whether or not it's different. Okay, um, so 